Are you excited for the word of the Lord? Hold on, let me ask it one more time. Are you, not my word, but are you excited for the word of the Lord? I am excited. I am excited to go into a season of my life where the word of the Lord is just everywhere. And that's, that's kind of the big picture of this message is that I really just want to hear God more clearly. I want to see exactly what he's saying. So I don't have to lean on my own understanding, but I could lean into the understanding of the Lord. Amen? Amen. So it's been a while since I preached last. And the last, I think it's been a little over a year since I preached on this pulpit. Um, back then, I was a little slimmer. I had just come off of a great diet. We lost about 30, 35 pounds. And I think at that time, yeah, at that time I preached on restoration. And by the grace of God, he's been slowly, day after day, restoring me back pound after pound. <laughs> he is a restorer, amen. So today I'm not preaching on restoration because I, I don't want to gain back all of it, okay? Maybe next time I preach on restoration is when I got a little bit more grace in my hair, and then I'll come back and preach on bringing it back to black, but... But it's funny, with, um, with this diet and exercise, there's, there's something that you have to do. And it's, you have to really intently focus on how much you consume and what you're consuming and how much you exercise, right? And that effort took, it was a daily effort. It was, it was every single day, I had to constantly dedicate time and mental capacity into what I'm eating and how much I'm exercising. And if it doesn't, if you're not on top of it and you don't prioritize it, a lot of times we get home from work, it's so easy to just sit down and put the exercise aside and say, you know what, I'm gonna eat good this week and it's gonna make up for it. And then next week it's, it just builds and builds and builds. It takes a mental prioritization. And sometimes it means moving some things down on your priority list. Right, it means moving oh, time with the kids. I have to deprioritize that a little bit to prioritize my health goals. How many times has our church deprioritized things in our life and made that room for our spiritual growth? I think we're living in a church age that's way different than any other time in history where the word of God has been as easy as opening the fridge and consuming the word of the Lord. You just go back 50 years ago where literacy was not there and you couldn't just open your Bible and read. You had to depend on going to church and hearing the word of the Lord from somebody else and you don't really know if they're interpreting it correctly. But now we have the full Bible in the palm of our hands, literally. We can consume so much. We could come to church. We could consume the word of the Lord day after day after day. We can turn on the TV and see what God is saying. We can turn on the radio in the morning and hearing encouraging music and hear the word of the Lord constantly. But I wonder, after all that consumption, are we exercising our faith? Are we balancing it out with an exercise of our faith. I think this church age and, and in general, we have lost that, that part of it where we, we're so concerned about consuming the word of the Lord and filling up in the spirit, but we've lost that exercise. Exercise to give. Exercise of faith to, to put some tithes and offerings into the into the church, into the kingdom, into somebody's hand that needs it. We need to get back to the place where we're exercising our faith in the same way that we consume the word of the Lord. So, I have a little exercise for us, okay? All right, humor me for a little bit. Let's take, take out our phones. Everybody, it's okay. You can take out your cell phone. Take out your cell phones. We're going to exercise our faith right now, okay? Open up your text messages. 
and I want you to text G-I-V-E. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> All right, I want you to pick somebody in your phone, in your contact list that you're close with, okay? I want somebody that is a prayer partner. It could be your spouse, someone that you're comfortable sending a ministering word to, okay? I'm going to pick my wife. If you don't have anybody that you're comfortable texting right now, open your phone, put in 407-810-2030, okay? <laughs> all right, and we're going to text this word together in faith, all right? As a declaration, text, today is the day. Today is the day. The Lord... will have his say, S-A-Y, say. Today is the day the Lord will have his say. And now, uh, before you hit send, I want you just to stand up for me for one second. And we're going to put some faith on this, okay? This is, and I know it, it's a little bit confusing right now, but if you don't mind, just stand up with me, humor me for a little bit. Now, I want you, we're going to pray on this word, okay? This is an act of faith into what the Lord has spoken to me, okay? You're going to be declaring this word of the Lord into somebody else's life today. Just bow your heads and close your eyes. Hold your phone. In the name of Jesus, right now, Lord God, we know that there has been things spoken to and from others that is not of you and in the name of jesus right now lord god we clear everything that has been said and spoken that is not from your lips god in the name of jesus we pray that we are going into a season where your word will be the only governing factor that your word from your spirit and from your lips will be our guide, and our lead. And in the name of Jesus, as we send this, this text, we send it in faith, Lord God, that today will mark the day where your word will be spoken and clearly directed in our lives. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Hit send. Oh. Ezra sent it to me. How cute. Amen. You, you can have your seat. So today my text is coming out of 1 Samuel 16, verses 1 through 13. 1 Samuel 16, verse 1 through 13. Now remember the topic today is this is the day the Lord will have his say. Okay? Now I'm going to explain that a little bit with this, with this verse. So chapter 16 in 1 Samuel is all about the anointing and the selection of King David. All right? Think of that. King David, greatest, one of the greatest characters of the Bible apart from Jesus Christ. His anointing, the day that God has selected him, 1 Samuel chapter 16. Okay? Now, at this time, Israel had already begged for a king. They wanted a king. They, this, they've never had a king before. They asked for a king. At that time, backing up a couple, 30 years or so, um, Israel had never had a king, but the nations around them had a king. And they had an army, and they were able to go into battle and defend themselves. And the, the elders of Israel saw the lack of having a physical king and not relying on God as their king as a weakness. And so they, they pleaded, we need a king, we need a king. So God allowed them to have a king. They rejected God as their king and leader, and they wanted a physical king to lead them into battle. So God, by his grace, allowed them to select a king. And that king they selected was Saul, okay? So Saul was anointed as the first king of Israel. Not because God selected Saul, but because God allowed them to select Saul. You see the difference? So God gave them grace to have a king, King Saul. 
He was tall, tall Saul, okay? Tall Saul was the first king of Israel under God's grace. And what do you think happened? He disobeyed the word of the Lord time after time after time to the point where it came where God said, I reject Saul as king of Israel. And this, and uh, I, let me go into who Samuel was. Samuel was the judge, one of the, the greatest judges in this time period. Okay, he was one of, very well respected, and he was also known as a prophet of the Lord. So he spoke the word of the Lord, interpreted the word of the Lord, and was one of the highest judges in, in the area of Israel. Okay? So very well respected, and he was the one who anointed Saul and also David. Okay? So Samuel was disheartened tremendously when God rejected Saul as king over Israel. Because he saw that all the things that he worked so hard for in, Samuel, in Saul and all the things he wanted Saul to be just never came about. It was all of the things that God allowed them to do. Yes, they won battles. Yes, they went to war. And yes, they were protected. But it didn't work out. And God rejected Saul. And that really disheartened Samuel. And in the beginning of chapter 16, that's where we're at that God has rejected the first king of Israel, okay? And it, Samuel is mourning. He's in mourning of this, this challenge. And the Bible says in verse 1, the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him king of Israel? How long are you going to mourn it? I didn't even look at my notes. Sorry. Hold on. Let me make sure I'm on track here. Okay, we're good. How long are you going to mourn it? Fill your horn with oil immediately. Don't worry about that I rejected these plans that you made. Don't worry about it. Let's move on. All right? It happened. I gave you grace. You did it wrong. It didn't work out. Let's go do it again. How long are you going to mourn that things didn't work out? How long are you going to mourn that things fell apart? I tried it my way, God. I tried it, and, and it just fell apart. I thought I was following your word. I thought I was doing it the way that you wanted to. And I worked, and I worked year after year after year on this issue, and it just fell apart. How long are you going to mourn that? And I feel like in the church today, God has given many people grace, grace to do it the way that they want. And he gave us his promise that I'm going to go with you and I'm going to go with my spirit. I'll give you my spirit and you can do it. But sometimes, even with God's grace, things fall apart. And we tend to lament on that and say, God, were you even in it? Did you even direct it? Now, God may have given you grace, but maybe he didn't direct it. And this is a very interesting chapter in chapter 16 where you see God shift from grace to direction. And I feel like in the church today, at least in my life, I want to get into a place where, okay, God, I know you gave me the grace and I know I can do it, but I don't want to wait for things to fall apart for me to go under the grace of God to the direction of God. I'm going to make a decision today where I'm going to move out of grace into a following of the Lord. I want to hear his words so clearly that I can just move in exactly the steps and areas that he's leading me. Amen? The Lord says, Samuel, how long are you going to mourn? I rejected him king over Israel. Let's move on. Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons. I have chosen. But Samuel again questions God, how can I go if Saul hears about it? He's going to kill me. Still fear and mourning. 
fear and mourning. That's what's in Samuel. And then the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. Now hear the shift in the Lord. And, and I kind of equate it to something that happens in my household. A lot of times I try to include the kids in uh, cleaning activities, right? So if the area needs to be vacuumed, the windows need to be cleaned, I'll let my son be in charge of the vacuum and my daughter be in charge of cleaning the windows. So my son, he'll take this big heavy vacuum and I'll sit back and watch. And what he does is he takes the vacuum cleaner, the end of it, and if there's a crumb on the couch, he'll vacuum that one crumb, okay? And he'll go around and vacuum up all the little crumbs that he can see, okay? And my daughter uh, does not clean the windows. She dirties them more than she cleans them. So it always comes into a place where, although I gave them grace to help, I always have to come back and correct. And because there's things that they can't see, that they couldn't figure it out yet, that they're not able to know that, hey, there's, there's dirt all over this place. You can't see it, but it's there. So you need to take that vacuum and go over each and every square inch of that couch. You need to wipe the windows and wait for it to dry before you keep scrubbing in more. You know, there's, there's, there's a time of grace, and then there's a time of leading and correction. And this is the shift that I feel happened in Israel at that time, where God allowed the first king to take place, right? But with David, there was, it was almost like God said, all right, you had your say. Let me have my say. You had your selection. Let me have my selection. You selected Saul, tall Saul, because he was tall. But let me select the next king. Let me have my say. And we're in a political climate, and we can talk about all of that, but we have a say too. And, and I don't want to say my say. I, I don't want to lean on what I think. I only want to lean into what the Lord has to say. I want the Lord to have his say. Somebody's been in a, in a season of grace, and that's amazing. But I think somebody else has been in a season that under grace, things have been falling apart. And you've been feeling things crumble. And you've been seeing things slip away. And you've been, maybe it's a financial burden or an ailment that keeps coming back and coming back and coming back. And you're just tired of trying to make it all work. I think today is the day where we can move into a season of direction and leadership under the Lord. And lean into that. Don't mourn that things didn't work out. Don't regret that things fell apart. But lean into the hands of the Lord and let him have his say in your life today. Amen? In chapter 9, that was the anointing of Saul. Okay. We saw God's provision and his allowance. We saw his grace. But in chapter 16, you'll see God's direction and his leading in this selection. I went through and I looked at when Saul was selected. The word the Lord said from when I started reading was found one time. And the words Samuel said or the, the summary of Samuel doing or actions of Samuel was listed about nine to ten times, depending on how you want to read it. When we look at chapter 16, you'll read through this. You can read through it on your own. But I counted ten times where the Lord himself, it says the Lord said, the Lord did, the Lord directed this, the Lord said yes, the Lord said no. Hey, I want to be in a chapter 16 in my life. I want to be in chapter 16. I'm tired of God just allowing me to let, let it all fall apart. I want God to lead because in his leadership, 
alone, it will work out. It'll work out for my good. I'm ready for a chapter 16 season in my life. We've let too many voices speak. We've let so many voices cloud the Lord's voice. There's so many voices constantly interfering on what the Lord is saying. We have political voices. We have the doctors having their say in, in what's happening in your own life and in your spirit. We have teachers and leaders all speaking. And so many times that just diminishes the word of the Lord. And that all has its place and its timing. But I feel like somebody is moving into a new season, out of a Saul season into a David season. But this is the day the Lord will have his say. Amen? Amen. 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 Now, we could continue reading through this verse here in chapters uh, in 4 through 11. Let me just read it quickly. Uh, Samuel did what the Lord said. Amazing. I could preach on that for a year. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled because he was a highly respected judge. Okay, pastor? Highly respected judge. They trembled. But it's not about what the judge says. It's about what the Lord has to say. Amen? Samuel replied in, chapter, in verse 5, Yes, in peace I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come into the sacrifice with, with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely, now the, this is the, the oldest son, right? Surely the Lord's anointed stands before, before me. He sees the oldest son. Oh, this is easy. This is a tall, strong man. This is who the Lord has anointed. The oldest brother. Has to be him, right? A warrior. But the Lord said to Samuel, again, this is his direction. Do not consider his appearance or his height. I've rejected him as well. The Lord does not look at the things people look at, but the look or the look at an outward appearance. But the Lord looks inward at the heart. And then Jesse called Abinadab and passed in front of Samuel. Nope. That's not the one the Lord chose. Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Seven times. Seven brothers. Seven times the Lord said no. And I didn't count that in the, in the ten, okay? Because the Bible didn't say it. But seven times the Lord said no. Okay? Somebody's heard that and felt that frustration. Time after time the Lord said no. Oh, I thought, but I thought this is, it looks, you, I came to the place you brought me to, God. And I seen everything, but you, you're still saying no? Like I did everything right. I, I sacrificed unto the Lord. I brought the heifer. I, I risked my life to come into this house seven times. No. The Lord said no. The Lord said no. The Lord said no. The Lord said no. Seven times I could just imagine what Samuel was thinking at this time. time. The Lord, you brought me all this way and did all of these things correctly for you to say no. But the wisdom of Samuel said, is there anybody else? Is there anyone else? And he said, I'm not going to sit down. The word says, I'm not going to sit down until... You go and bring the last one. So there's seven in the house, okay? Seven in the house and one outside tending the sheep. Seven inside, one outside. I'm just going to say this because it's on my heart, but I don't know if somebody feels left out that came into the church today feeling that they've been on the outside that they've been sitting out, feeling unworthy, 
feeling too little, feeling unheard. I don't know who made you feel that way. I don't know if you, you've been looked over or unseen. I don't know if what, what the situation is in your life, but I know that somebody here today feels like the one left out, that God forgot, that God did not include. Maybe you're feeling like you're on the outside. But I want to tell you, the Lord sees each and every one of his believers. The Lord sees you right where you are. The Lord sees you and has called you right where you sit or where you stand. The Lord sees you right where you are in your pain, in your depression, in your fear, in your anxiety. The Lord sees you right where you are. You are not left out. You are not forgotten. You are not left behind, but God has chosen you and he has called you and he loves you and he wants to bring you in. Okay. Amen. 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 Give God some praise. You might feel small, quiet, unworthy. But sitting outside, the outsider, you know what God sees? God sees a giant killer. God sees somebody who can take down a Goliath for him. God sees a king and a queen. God sees something so much greater than we can ever imagine. God sees what you can really be in the spirit of God, in his spirit. Because greater is he that is within me than he is within the world. Let's keep reading, okay? Verse 12. So he sent for him and had him brought in. Now, this is David. David was glowing with health, and he had fine appearance and handsome features, just like me. <laughs> then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. I love how the, the Lord just directed all over this chapter. I want you guys to reread it and just see how many times the Lord directed. Rise and anoint him. This is the one. Now, I'm going to make a bold statement here. I'm going to be comparing each and every believer to David, okay? So keep that in your back of your mind, and I'm going to be putting you in the same anointing. And I'm going to show you where that is true biblically, okay? So I want you to imagine God saying this to you. And if we put it in the context of Jesus Christ, I can make this statement, okay? Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of the nose, in the brothers. And from that day, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. The spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David after the anointing. How many of you believe that you have been anointed by the Lord? How many of you want to be anointed by the Lord? How many of you want the Holy Spirit to come powerfully upon you? How many of you want that type of anointing and selection by the Lord and power and movement of his spirit in your life? Now, something amazing happens with Jesus Christ, okay? Now, just understand how selective this anointing was in the Old Testament. This type of anointing was made for kings. And the Holy Spirit was reserved for people in high places, prophets, priests, kings. That's who were selected to be anointed. God had to choose the anointed. Right? Okay? So follow me. I'm going to go to 
first, sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 to 23, sorry, 22. Now, this is New Testament, okay? We're going to preach a little bit here. New Testament, Paul writing to the Corinthians. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ, and through him, amen. It is spoken to us by the glory of God. And Pastor Ciceran uh, preached on this the other, this sealed and shielded. And I'm, I'm going to build on that a little bit and say, I'm sealed, shielded, anointed, and appointed in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's read this verse together, okay? It says, Now it is God who makes both of us and you stand firm in Christ. He has anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Now, modern Christianity has taken the word anointing to a whole different level, and especially post-Jesus Christ. To where now we have anointed uh, worship leaders and anointed, you can be anointed to preach or uh, apologetic anointing or you can have a a prophetic anointing or we misuse this word so much, the anointing, the anointing, the anointing, different types of anointings. No, those are different gifts of the Holy Spirit and the, the power of the Holy Spirit manifests itself different ways in different people but the anointing of the lord the anointing of the saints is mentioned one time in the new testament and the anointing of the saints is mentioned the only time here in second corinthians chapter one and it is anyone who believes in christ and has accepted him in his heart in their heart is anointed with the spirit is anointed and given the Holy Spirit. That is an amazing thing when you really understand it, that you have something that in Old Testament they could have never dreamed of. We have access and anoint, we've been anointed and access to the Holy Spirit, each and every one of us. And so we look back at the anointing of David and we see Samuel pouring oil and the Holy Spirit coming powerfully upon him and then we see him doing all these mighty things in the spirit every single one in this room has that similar type of anointing every single one in this room can move and work in the spirit because God has done it through Jesus Christ through the blood of Jesus Christ that was the sacrifice and the and that similar to what Samuel did and the consecration You have something amazing. Don't let the world water it down. Don't let the voices of everybody, this one and that one, make you feel like your anointing is something to be, it's almost common. Your anointing is amazing and unique. And God has chosen you and God has loved you and he he blessed you and he gave you his spirit, his spirit powerful Holy Spirit that you can do and be amazing and do amazing things and be amazing in in Christ. But it gets us back to a place of exercising our faith, understanding the word of the Lord and walking in faith and in the anointing. Because what good is it to be anointed and have the Holy Spirit and do nothing with it? That's why Jesus said, go clothe the poor. Feed the hungry. Be an extension of my arm. That's why I gave you the spirit. To do something amazing with it. Let's move into a season where God, God's voice is the lead. Where we are so focused on your word, God, that every other voice is drowned out by your word. God, let us just hear exactly what you want to say. 
Let us hear exactly what you're saying, Lord God, because you're always speaking and you're always ready to take the lead. God, in the name of Jesus, we declare today as a church that we are moving into a season led by you, God. Just like the Israelites leaving Egypt, God, that we would be led like a pillar of fire, God, just right in front of us, taking us right where we need to go. God, we lean into your understanding and we trust in your word. I pray today, Lord, that somebody will move, into, move out of a season under Saul and into a season of David, one that's led and directed by the Lord Jesus Christ. If you believe that, just give God some praise. Give him some praise. Give him some praise. God has a work for you to do. God has a Goliath for you to slay. If somebody just stand on your feet, just stand to your feet. Just stand to your feet. Let's just give God some praise on his word. We thank you, Lord God, for your word. Come on, just give him some worship. Just, just praise the name of the Lord. Just lift him up and say, God, I know, I know who I am in you. Let this be the day the Lord has his say. God bless you, saints. God bless you, church. God bless you, church.